Welcome to Naked Reflections, brought to you from the Wolf Institute. I'm Ed Kessler, and each week I'll be taking an in-depth look at the stories reported by our friends over at The Naked Scientists. What does the latest scientific stuff mean for the rest of us? Stay with us and find out. Such, such were the joys when we all girls and boys in our youth time were seen on the echoing green. William Blake's view of childhood is sentimental, charming and I guess widely shared, but William Golding's pushback in the novel Lord of the Flies, when children regress to savagery, is disturbing and in some way just as true. The history of our attitudes to childhood is fascinating and distorted. With me to discuss aspects of childhood are Simon Baron Cohen, Professor of Psychology and Psychiatry here at the University of Cambridge and Director of the University's Autism Research Centre, Lindsay Burton, a PhD student at the Centre for Research on Children's Literature, and Julian Stanley, founding CEO of the National Charity Education Support Partnerships. It's a big subject. Here's Dr. Hannah Newton of the University of Reading speaking on the Naked Scientist podcast. Obviously there are cases of children being treated badly in any period, but to be honest, I think really this is quite a big myth in the history of childhood. And when you look back at parents' diaries and letters and personal documents from the early modern period and, and before, the overwhelming picture is of kindness to children and concern about them and their upbringing. Part of the issue is that we have a slightly different conception of childhood to how people in the past understood it. And for us, the idea of a child starting work at a young age seems to us incompatible with a concept of childhood. But in the early modern period, it was actually a necessity for financial survival that children contributed to the family income. It didn't mean they didn't see their children as children, and children were still thought to be different from adults, and things that distinguished them were their love of play, their curiosity, their need for affection and love... So, Lindsay, what did you think about that? So, um, I'm I'm reminded of, um, and I'm going to butcher the French pronunci- pronunciation, I'm sorry, Philippe um, Arrier's uh, Centuries of Childhood. So, one of the most famous his- and probably the first modern history of childhood um, is quite famous for saying that uh, there was no such thing as childhood in the medieval era. Um, and he has since been... Uh, criticized heavily on a number of points that he raises in his book, but the idea sort of stuck that um, that childhood is a contemporary modern phenomenon. Um, and certainly uh, children's literature and media and, and uh, a children's economy, an economy of things for children, is a relatively modern phenomenon. And we've, of course, seen advances in terms of the rights of children with the UN treating on the rights of the child um, and such. Julian. <laughs> it felt like a bit of an apology, really, for um, uh, allowing child labour. And it was 19, I think it was 1924, 34, the uh, Rights for the Child, first Declaration of Rights for Children. Mm-hmm. So, you know, that's not very long ago, actually, uh, when it became enshrined. Um, but if we go back into, um, I don't know, biblical texts, you know, um, uh, Christian, Judaic and Islamic texts, uh, we see that the child has a special place. But that doesn't necessarily mean that childhood has been, was ever an, uh, an idyllic. And much of it's mediated by class and social background and, mm. uh, uh, and still is, I think. Mm. And we still see huge amounts of violence um, against children. And I would just add that, you know, the notion of creating child-friendly environments, to me that does feel quite a modern notion. Mm. So it's not that childhood, you know, was invented at a particular point. I'm sure it was always there and always, you know, given its place. So creating child-friendly hospitals, child-friendly schools, child-friendly supermarkets or trains and so forth. It's It's in every part of our society that we're starting to think about how to make things child friendly. Julian, we were saying just before we started that attitudes towards childhood seem to come to the fore in some of the work that you do. Yes, yeah, certainly when I'm working with teachers and head teachers, um, it's very interesting, apart from talking about obviously the work they're doing with their pupils, with children, and the issues that they face daily, often around behaviour, mental health problems, as well as just the normal curriculums and learning that they have to kind of get through, their own issues come to the fore. Actually, um, when people are pushed and under stress or strain, um, it's interesting how when they have a chance to reflect, they think about how they were as children or what's impacted on them as children and how that informs their behaviour. 
And that can be business people, but it's particularly common, obviously, with teachers. And so I do quite a bit of work with them on reflective practice. And that's very interesting because it's very rare for teachers in particular to get enough time to be able to think about how they interact with children, particularly the children they don't like very much. And the emotional reactions that people have to others it can be very strong. And that often is benefits when it's unpicked slightly. Uh, it works very well in a group in particular, I found. Lindsay, you were shaking your head at one moment there. It's just a very post-Freudian approach to the <laughs> adult-child relationship. Um, I was reminded of um, an assignment that master's students at, um, at the education faculty who are studying children's literature have to do. It's the very first assignment they do when they get to Cambridge. And they have to do a critical, they have to write a critical bibliography of their own childhood reading. So it's part reflection on their childhood, part analysis of these children's books and then also you know practicing implementing critical thoughts on top of both of those and it's actually um, a very difficult thing uh, for students to do it's it's the hardest assignment they have much harder than the thesis they say um, because uh, having to critically consider their own childhoods separately from the books that they read um, you know, especially when you've come to Cambridge to research children's literature, it's obviously very important to you. Um, but it's a it's a good assignment anyway because it creates this space, as you said, to really consider um, the books separate from the childhood. So uh, I was listening to you, Julian, in terms of schools and the classroom, mm. um, because uh, I hope this is true. But you, you you may be able to kind of throw some light on this that mental ill health used to be quite stigmatized and children themselves or young people perhaps didn't want to talk about it didn't um, didn't really reveal that maybe they were struggling and what I hope is true is that there's less stigma that young people are talking much more openly about when they're having a hard time um, I, I do think that's true in secondary education in particular I, I find that um, I mean, the problem is in today's uh, context, you know, uh, um, so social political context is that there's very little access for people to train and develop their skills in this area. So it's a lot. So teachers are asked to do a lot of different things, mm. um, but there is much more awareness and there is much more sympathy for people yeah. that have actually difficulties. Yeah, because the, cause the evidence is suggesting that, you know, as many as one in four young people are struggling with their mental health. And it's true that the, the focus is on teenagers and even, you know, sort of adolescents more broadly. Uh, but you can assume that it's probably also there even in, you know, pre-adolescence, in, in early childhood too. That's reported more se certainly, I hear that more frequently yeah. in, in junior school. And, you know, the awareness is there because if you switch on the television, you, you hear talk about mental health. So it feels like it's, you know, it's, it's no longer a taboo area. And I think that must be a good thing. Uh, as a former teacher, I think um, it also somewhat comes down to contact hours and just, you know, access and time. You, you see, you know, as a secondary teacher, you see your students maybe an hour a day. Um, and it, I often felt when I had students who had mental health issues or who needed further intervention, um, for whatever reason, I didn't have enough time. Uh, with them to make the kind of impact I wanted to make compared to, say, parents um, who, in theory, have many more hours of contact with their own children. Mm. So what should we be aspiring towards? You know, uh, you know, are we expecting the government to just create more funding? Or, yeah, well, I think there's always a difficult know. thing. That is, we can't wait for, for funding yeah. to appear. I think there's an important piece of work to do on the what I call the sort of triad which is the teacher parent child relationship yeah because actually that's where you can have most impact because lots of parents struggle around um, the issue of their children's mental health and potentially their own and it can be quite scary if you haven't got anybody to talk to about that kind of thing um, so just a bit of parent training I, well, I think as parents, it's a difficult job anyway, and nobody gives you any training. So right. if you've if you've not <laughs> if you're not reading about these issues, if you're not familiar with them, if your own parents haven't raised those issues with you when you grew up, I mean, 
you know, I came from a background where people didn't really talk about how they felt and what they thought in mm. any great depth about themselves. It was mm. much more functional. I think that's changed a lot mm. for, for many people. But I still suspect there's a whole chunk of people out there who have nobody to talk to about the way in which they think and feel. Mm. I think it's uh, that also goes back to your very first point. Um, when parents parent, I suspect they often draw on their own childhoods and their own memories of their childhoods and how they were parented. So it just becomes a little self-reinforcing um, as time goes on. Definitely. And is there a way of breaking that down, Lindsay? Now that you've been on both sides, your your you know teacher training, being a teacher, and now studying literature and and childhood, what what, what have you learned? What a question. Um, <laughs> and I, I should say I'm not the parent, um, which is the other key piece in here that I think brings a lot of information to the table. Um, you know, it, it's interesting. In, in literary studies of, of children's literature, there's a disconnect between um, what we refer to as didacticism of children's literature. So using literature and media for children to teach, to instruct, um, to bring about change, to mold them into adults, and enjoyment. And just, you know, this is, this is media for children to have fun with, the way we read a book for pleasure or watch a TV show for pleasure. Um, you know, and it, it's, it's a split. The very first children's, well, the first modern children's book, um, A Little Pretty Pocket Book, just by John Newberry, came out in 1744. Um, and it, it was accompanied with this uh, engraving in the beginning um, instruction with delight, and a woman sitting with a book and two children looking at her raptly. Um, and so that's sort of been part of children's literature um, production since the beginning. How do you balance wanting to train children up to be functional adults, um, but also how do you keep them engaged, keep them entertained, make it fun at the same time? And interestingly, that book actually um, was sold with toys. So either a ball for a boy or a pincushion for a girl. Mm. So that's interesting, the notion of play, mm. the notion of pleasure and play. Yeah. Is, and it's critically important but, for children. But maybe books have a place here, and you're the expert on this, but you know, um, you're talking about books from the 18th century or whatever, but even today, if we can have books for kids that are about mental health, so that again, the, you know, the topic isn't taboo, it's actually being talked about whether it's at bedtime reading, you know, that some of the characters are struggling with anxiety or depression. So it's not something that is kind of invisible. It's actually, you know, that books may be one way into having the conversation. So you've talked about the question of literature, but it extends beyond that to the arts as a whole, doesn't it, Si? And I think you've, you've been involved in, in uh, The Transporters. Yeah, The Transporters is a, a children's animation that we created to help particularly autistic children who struggle to recognize emotions to have the opportunity to learn them. So autistic children often don't look up at people's faces, so they're missing out on social experience, mm. particularly about emotional expression. We created um, a series, it's a, 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 like a television series, um, so short, like four-minute episodes where children see vehicles that they might find uh, more comfortable to watch but where there are faces on the front of these vehicles, uh, reacting with emotional expressions. So it gives them a sort of safe place to start learning about emotions. Uh, and then we can look to, through research to see if they're actually... How have they responded to that? So autistic children find that much, many of them, find that a much more comfortable way in to the whole world of people and faces and emotions. And then you can do research to evaluate whether they are actually uh, improving in their emotion recognition we found that that is the case. We, and we've focused a lot in this part of the conversation about um, emotional experiences as determining you know, whether you um, grow up with a sense of security and self-esteem or, or not. What about the peer group, which we haven't really talked about? Yeah. Um, but you know, if, if the peer group is also becoming much more, not just aware, but uh, accepting, and um, maybe, you know, realizing that they too have a role to support the child in the class who's very withdrawn or very shy or very stressed. I mean, it would be nice to think that that, I, I think that does happen in certain ways when I think back to classrooms that I've been in and I've, I've observed. But I also think, you know, there's a lot of issues around um, 
I mean, natural behaviour in children often, which is, you know, envies and jealousies and so on and bullying and so on. These are quite mm. prevalent uh, in schools um, across the social divide, actually. So it's interesting. I don't know. But most schools now have a kind of anti-bullying policy. But the question mm. is, do they have something a bit more sort of proactive and positive about, you know, giving the peer group, the other kids in the class who are functioning, you know, some of the tools or some of the strategies for how to reach out to uh, the children who are having a hard time. I have to say I'm quite reminded of Lord of the Flies again uh, at the idea, which isn't to say that peer groups can't be hugely supportive um, for students who need it, uh, but I think that there's um, a question there. If you think of adults who are having the same kind of struggles with uh, mental health or what you know, what have you, I, I don't know that reliance on peer group is what they're directed to do. Mm, um, it can be problematic. Yeah, I don't know how uh, reliably you can have the peer group support other students that way. You're listening to Naked Reflections, and my guests this week are Simon Baron Cohen, Lindsay Burton, and Julian Stanley. Let's hear another clip from Hannah Newton on the Naked Scientists. This time she's talking about Victorian theories of childhood. One author wrote that children's brains are drowned and drunk with moisture and humours. Um, and this was why children weren't very rational. And it also accounted for their emotional tendencies. Children cry very easily and get very happy and very sad very quickly. And that emotional fluctuation was put down to the fact that the rational soul, the part of the soul responsible for reason, was slightly incapacitated by all this liquid. And for this reason, children's brains were thought to be like wax. They were very impressionable, which made them peculiarly capable of learning and also made them a time in their life really when their personality was thought to be formed. Some premonitions of modern neuroscience there. Sai, I'd like to sort of move back to the earlier stages of mm. childhood and the development, the development of the personality. That's an, an area of your expertise. Mm. What, what's the latest research telling us? I think um, that the latest research is still in line with some of the very classic Old research. <laughs> That's so, encouraging. So, so, you know, a lot of the kind of founding ideas came from uh, a psychologist called John Bowlby, yeah. who worked at the Tavistock Attach- cl- Clinic. Attachment theories. Particularly so. around the, the concept of attachment and the, the importance of having a secure attachment with a caregiver, often a parent, and, you know, uh, hopefully for most kids, more than one caregiver, you know, two parents or a grandparent so that the child is getting a sense of being loved and valued and being important right from the beginning. And you know, that, was, that was revolutionary in its day back in the 1950s. The idea that, you know, that, that children take, you know, they, they take stock of, these, of what they're receiving from, from adults, that you can't, you know, that previously it might have been acceptable to send your child off to boarding school or send your child off for um, significant amounts of time. But actually, it was it was understood from Bowlby's work that those kinds of separations can have a big emotional impact, and I think you know the new neuroscience is is, is supporting that idea. There's work coming out of the Anna Freud Center in London, mm, for example, excellent work. Uh, part of UCL, just kind of documenting that the first year of life, a lot of the kind of circuitry that's being laid down in in the brain, is uh, is the result of the quality of emotional relationships that that child is receiving. And so really what you're saying is from the late 50s to the present day, we we still have the same views of childhood. Well, I think we've got new tools, but some of the ideas have stood the test of time. And would you say Mm. that the personality of the child who becomes the adult, that's formed at this very, very early stage, or is that develop uh, as they go in through the early years through to primary school? It's not that, you know, that the early years are the only uh, time when uh, experiences are important. But if you look at people who develop um, quite significant psychiatric difficulties in Mm. later life, and look back at their childhoods, there is a big link. So something like borderline personality disorder, people who have real problems in regulating their emotions, forming uh, trust with other people, and um, being able to have kind of stable relationships, a very significant majority, something like 80%, suffered from neglect or even abuse in their early childhoods. Julian, is this something that you find uh, in the work that you do when you're working with teachers that when they kind of unpack it, if there's a problem with a, a child in, in the classroom, it goes back to the family or goes back to the, uh, the, uh, that environment? 
Yes, many teachers spot signs of difficulty at home, let's put it like that. And um, often where there's very strong relationships between teachers and the parents of a pupil, there can be an alliance and that alliance can be very, very powerful and helpful. And uh, today in schools, often um, they assign uh, t other teachers to coach or look after or look out for particular children or groups of children um, who are displaying symptoms of difficulty in terms of their behaviour or their interactions with other children. Um, and so that, that's a very powerful tool, actually, mm. because often children are very isolated because they don't want to be disloyal to their parents. And they you only know what you know. You don't know anything different. You're brought up at home. You mm. assume that the way you are being parented is the way to be parented. We, and we've focused a lot in this part of the conversation about um, emotional experiences as determining, you know, whether you um, grow up with a sense of security and self-esteem yeah. or or not. But there's another another whole chunk of of children who struggle, not because they didn't receive plenty of love, but because of so-called neurodevelopmental mm. factors. You know, it's just it's partly genetic. Um, and how the brain gets wired up. So you're talking autism here. And autism, uh, kids disorders. who are kind of late to talk, you know, so most yes. kids are sort of developing language without much effort, you know, that children are saying their first words by 12 months and whole sentences by their yes. second birthday, you know, but there are a, a, a percentage of children who don't develop language and social skills, not because of lack of love or lack of support from their families, but for, for genetic, partly genetic reasons. Uh, and they need support too. You know, they need to be picked up. So we shouldn't just always be focusing on what have the families not been providing. You know, there are just differences. That's a really important point. There are differences point, yeah. in the population, you know, and some, some kids talk early, some kids talk late. And the kids who are talking late may, may struggle in things like turn-taking or participating in classroom activities and so forth. They may need extra support and even a diagnosis of a disability. Well, autism was once refrigerator mother syndrome, wasn't it? Yeah. Long, you yeah. know, decades ago. Yeah, probably not since about the 1960s. Yeah. So I think most people now recognize that it's a, a biomedical condition. Mm. So there's more awareness but whether there's enough services and support yeah. is still, you know, at play. I'm interested in where the phrase the came from. The idea that um, uh, it w autism was caused by emotionally distant mothers, which has been completely debunked as nonsense yeah, at this yeah. point. Um, but I, I would point out that the parent is still a really important figure. You know, it, obviously, funding cuts and resources. Uh, not being available, notwithstanding, you know, it is still the parent that is mm. the first responder and the mediator of re any resources, um, you know, state provided, privately provided for yeah. a child who needs them. I would agree. But, you know, parents themselves can experience stress. Mm -hmm. And so they may themselves need support. Mm. Uh, so if we take autism, for example, you know, it's now kind of quite clear that parents of autistic mm. kids experience a lot of stress if their child isn't sleeping and they the parents have to try to get to work the next day. Yes. Um, you know, high rates of, of marital breakdown in families where there's an autistic child. So although we should be turning to parents to kind of be, to be, you said, sort of mediating the support for the child, I think we need to also make sure that there is family support. Yeah, and I think that links in, doesn't it, to the notion of communities and the importance of communities, um, whether you're involved in a local group, whether you're involved in a religious community, um, not being isolated is particularly mm. important in being able to kind of mm. uh, make some uh, sense of difficult situations. Oh, sorry, Lindsay, I thought you were looking. Um, <laughs> no, just <coughs> just reflecting. Uh, my brother is actually autistic, mm -hmm. um, so it, I'm just I'm reflecting on the experience yeah. of growing up as a sibling and the the. Yeah. Um, uh, experience of, of accessing respite, uh, not care, but respite activities for my parents and exactly. for myself. So, you know, so you do have that um, family perspective, mm. including the impact on you as a sibling. Yeah, mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, but coming back to this idea of destigmatizing and of raising awareness, there's an interesting new word that's out there, which is called neurodiversity. Neurodiversity really just means that we're all very different but our brains are very different. So there isn't a single way to either be normal um, and, but, you know, by the same token, 
if you're not conforming to some notion of normality, it means that you're abnormal. We're kind of throwing away that very binary, kind of almost um, mythical notion of the normal child, and we're recognizing that there are many ways mm. to, for children to develop. So that's neurodiversity. But do we not need some sense of what normality is, even if it's a myth, even if it's a, a breadth to what normal is? Because we certainly taking it beyond the question of childhood, we, we, we live with a myth, the myth of the nation, the myth of a community, the myth of society. So isn't there something that you quite, quite dangerous about saying there's no such thing as normal? Uh, so I think that normal implies we should all be the same. And what, what neurodiversity gives us is just like we've, we think about diversity in other parts of society. You know, we're now thinking about diversity of brains and about difference. So I don't think that's dangerous. I mean, I think you're right that we still need to have some notion of morality. We're not saying that there's no kind of uh, boundaries on what counts as, as moral behavior. So we still need to be thinking about what, 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 you know, what, what would be a good society. So really it's about living with difference, that we're, we're all different, but how we live together Precisely. with difference. Yeah. So whereas the autistic child, even before we had a term like autism, might have been the child who was bullied for being different, you know, today I think, you know, children in the mainstream are recognizing differences are just part of any community. Uh, some people may struggle with certain things and the idea of uh, picking on a person just because they're different is no longer acceptable. It's also mm -hmm. worth noting if we, if we pull back and consider, you know, human society as a whole, um, and we think about norming, the adult is normed and the child is ultimately othered. Um, it's one of the last power binaries that we don't really talk about. Um, and plays a huge role in children's literature theory. Um, the f big fancy word for it is adonormativity, the idea that we norm based on age. Um, so in that sense, the autistic child and the neurotypical child are actually not that far apart from each other um, in that they're both sort of put into this othered category by adults who sit around doing podcasts about them. And, and can you give us an example in, in, in literature? You talked about... Uh, what, what sort of things, what sort of texts or books might you be thinking of? All of them. Um, if they're written for children, um, they are sort of inherently uh, adonormative. If you think about children's literature, it is written by adults, it is published by adults, it's marketed by adults, it's sold and purchased by adults. Children are, it's, are receptive mm -hmm. of it. Mm -hmm. um, and, and you have um, overt examples, you know, Little Pretty Pocket Book I mentioned earlier, but tons of educational books. Um, you know, very intentionally done up for educational purposes. But even Harry Potter, um, you know, the more popular mm. books for enjoyment can't help but reinforce adult normativity, adult authority um, in, in subtle ways. So can you see the development of children's literature written by children for children? So this is... Um, actually, a very uh, contemporary discussion. It's interesting um, with the advent of the internet and this thing called fan fiction. Um, you, you actually have a, a greater percentage of, of children, typically you know preteens or teens, writing for each other. Um, you know, it's it's not traditional publishing. It's outside of um, you know any sort of money making avenue, but it's, uh, it's it's thriving. It's a thriving community. Um, so in, in a sense, it is growing. Well, I think we've reached the end of this podcast. So thanks to my guests, Simon Baron-Cohen, Lindsay Burton and Julian Stanley. And thanks to you for listening. If you'd like to get in touch with any comments, thoughts, feedback or reflections of your own, you can email reflections at nakedscientists.com. In the meantime, you can find more episodes of Naked Reflections and subscribe to Naked Reflections podcast at nakedscientists.com slash reflections. Do join us next time 